Hello and welcome to the latest Royal Automobile Club talk show in association with Motorsport. I'm Simon Aaron, featured editor of the magazine, and I'm delighted to say I'm joined today by our newly appointed editor, Joe Dunn. Congratulations, Joe. And also, fantastic pleasure to welcome one of the best known names in motor racing, six times a winner of Le Mans, a winner at Bathurst, a winner of eight Grand Prix, a winner of the Dakar Rally. If we listed everything, we'd run out of time for any questions. But Jackie Ix, it's lovely to see you here at the Royal Automobile Club in London. You're, you're in the UK at the moment, I gather, doing, um, you've been doing the 356 International Tour with uh, Schuppach and Porsche. What, what's been your role in, uh, in this event? Well, probably um, it's um, all about a family affair. Um, I am with Chopin for 30 years, and uh, when I say a family affair, really by Chopin, it's, uh, it's a family business. And also, you know that uh, in motor racing, I have been linked to Porsche to for, Porsche for 10 time. years, <laughs> but also I was 10 years before in the opposition. So we have been together in different uh, attitudes, but uh, it's also my family. And it's clear that for Chopin and, um, and Porsche to be together, they have the same thoughts about precision, uh, job well well done so it was very natural and it's clear that uh, the fact that at the moment uh, it's always about timing and everything so it has it has given me the pleasure to come and visit you uh, in london and of course to be close to all these porsche customers who own these uh, three five sixes or made porsche legendary Talking of families, let's go back to your very early days in motorsport. Now, your father was a journalist. I can't recall whether he's a motoring journalist or a sports journalist, but I believe it was him that introduced you to motor racing. Well, maybe they, maybe they are some linked, but basically the story is slightly different. Recently, I say I never did what I wanted in life, really. What did you want in life? I wanted to be a gardener, Obvious, or, obviously. <laughs> or a game or a gamekeeper, and honestly, the idea for me was to be linked to the nature, to uh, the freeness of the nature and all that. But you know, you see, in life sometimes the um, the destiny is slightly different. Finally, I had the advantage. I had the advantage of not being good at school, to be tempted to look by the window uh, every five minutes, to be sitting on the back of the class, to be next to the radiator. I wasn't disturbing anyone, but worse I was at school, more my parents were generous with me. So once they offered me a motorcycle, and with that motorcycle I start to do a trial, motorcycle trial. And then um, I saw the great champion Sammy Miller and Gordon Jackson in these days. And then also I discovered the pleasure to be on the podium. Rather than being last, I realized that finally I was good at something. And it was very exciting. And then the rest, it's done by the people you meet in life. And the rest is done by people who decided to let me drive a BMW 700, to let me drive a, a Cortina Lotus, to drive for Team Lotus in Cortinas or Mustangs. And then, and then, and then, Ken Tyrrell, who changed my life because he picked me up in a saloon car racing. At the time I was in the army training to spin uh, tanks and uh, it was nice too, but finally, my life took me to uh, car racing, and uh, I was pr very privileged. Did you feel that your motorcycle, your beginnings in, on a motorcycle on two wheels, helped you later in life when you're racing cars? Without any doubt. Because because the balance, I'd imagine. Because the balance on two wheels, <clears throat> on two wheels, clearly, it's not easy. Trial, it's really a, a, a lovely exercise. But at this, during these five years, early days, I did not only try, I did also um, 
the international six days enduro, a D drive for Suzuki in the uh, 50cc category, these uh, nine speed 50cc running, uh, revving at 18,000 revs already in those days. We talk about uh, 1961, 62, 63. So yes, it was an advantage. It was two times an advantage, definitely on wet conditions. Um, I had the needed sensitivity to drive well on, uh, on water, and it helped me a lot also in the Paris-Dakar. So when, where and when did Ken Tyrrell first approach you? Um, Ken watched me at the Buda Budapest Saloon car race six hours, and um, he said, you want to drive, uh, would you like to make a test for me? He was at the, mo at the time uh, a Formula 2 team with Cooper, I think. And I say, no, unfortunately, I am in the army, I'm practicing to slide uh, tanks. You will have to wait another year, because the army was mandatory at the time in Belgium. And it was a 15, a 15 months period. So the amazing things, one at the end, I was free and uh, leaving the army. He said, please come to Goodwood, the famous, the famous Goodwood. And uh, that was my first race course with a single seater. I think I spent maybe eight times at the chicane. This was in the Formula and 2 Cooper? In the Formula 2 Cooper, and I crashed at the end in one of these fast corner. So the start was a little bit uh, special, let's Mi say. Mixed. <laughs> mixed. But in those days, it was accepted yeah. to have eventually an accident or the experience of a crash. The difference is today, if you crash two times, you are really in trouble. But Having small crashes at the time was something accepted, and uh, that's why I say Ken really changed my life. He really did. Of course, those those days also, Formula Two cars were lining up with Formula One cars in the same at the same time. Yes, it happened. Uh, yes, because there were only few uh, there were only few Formula Ones in those days uh, on certain Grand Prix, so they were used to put Formula Two into it. But my only experience in those days was the Nürburgring German Grand Prix. Uh, it was common up there, but not every Grand Prix where the Formula 2 I, I was going to ask you about Germany 1967, because you're in your Ken Tyrrell Matra Formula 2 car in practice. And I think only Jim Clark and Denny Holm went faster than you in Formula 1 cars. So you were third fastest overall in a Formula 2 car. But because of the rules, you had to start behind all the Formula One cars, True. and True. then you overtook most of them again. I think you got True. up to fourth or fifth. I mean, that, did it all seem quite easy to you back then? I mean, you were 22 years old, which is quite young for a, for a racing driver at that period. Um, did it all just seem very natural to you? You were supposed to be experienced to drive a Formula One in those days. But um, the success always depends on different factors. I only, truly, I think, to drive at the Nürburgring with a Formula 2 was much easier to drive a car like that than a, a Formula 1. Secondly, I knew the Nürburgring very, very, very well, because I did two times the 86 horse Marathon de la Route. So I knew every single corner, every single hole on the track. I could almost do it close eyes. And um, the only regret may, we may have maybe about it is that I was using the Formula 2 from the previous year. And sometimes I was using Jackie Stewart's car, who was really much performing better and much better. Because I think I would have even done, done much better in the Grand Prix with the other car. But um, the success was amazing. Uh, it was a surprise for everyone, including uh, me. And from that on, I went to uh, Formula One. Well, I was going to say, because you did a year in single-seaters in 1967, you won the European Formula Two Championship, the first European Formula Two champion. 1968, you're driving for Enzo Ferrari. 
How did how did how did the contact with Ferrari come around, and what were you, what were your first impressions of Enzo? When you are twenty two years old, sometimes you consider you consider things as normal, because it's a fact that when you are offered to drive for Ferrari, it's something very special. Still to still today, the. the Ferrari uh, story is just incredible, incredible on that matter. But uh, I signed for Ferrari because Jackie Stewart didn't sign for uh, Ferrari at the time. In August, it was supposed Jackie went to uh, the other Jackie went to uh, Marane Maranello uh, to try to find a deal with Enzo Ferrari, who didn't work. So at the end of uh, August, they came to see me in uh, Pergoza in a Formula 2 race and say, would you accept to, uh, to drive for us? And who would have said no? Huh? Jackie Stewart did. Well, <laughs> Jackie, Jackie Stewart asked for too much money, he says, didn't he? Um, that what he said? He, he, yes. Also, also, I was told that he came with his lawyer. At the time, it was totally unusual. And also, maybe his request was too high. I don't know, honestly. I wasn't there uh, watching. But um, you just have to keep the fact that I went there because uh, Jackie didn't do it. So he opened involuntary the door to Formula One to, to me. And then, uh, and then, and then. And then it was a successful year in a way. Enfin, depends how and where. But for example, um, I was able to win the French Grand Prix. You know the Rouen Les Essa. You you heard about this track? I've driven I've driven, I've driven round what's what's okay, left of it. Okay, yeah. I went there the other day, a week ago, for um, um, a little film for uh, the French television. Because it's 50 years ago, nearly, that you won that race. Yes, yeah. but the film was made about the uh, Grand Prix de France. Yeah. And there is nothing left of that track. Or was won by Fangio, or was won by Ascari, uh, the Formula One, or was won two times by uh, Gurney. A year ago, or two years ago, I drove Dan's car, the Porsche 804, at Monaco, in, in demo. And you know, if you are a sentimental person, knowing that you on a you're doing well on a race course where Ascari, for example, uh, won, where Fangio won, or when you drive uh, the car of Dan Gurney in Monaco, and I suppose you have good memories of Dan, was really a very charming and talented uh, driver. It's all very exciting, but the point is about the French Grand Prix in uh, Rouen les Essars. There is nothing left of it. You don't see anything. You have to be an archaeologist to find a curb who was there at the time. The forest has gained the territory uh, on the track, and it's almost forgotten. That was the reason of uh, this uh, this um, documentary on. Uh, Le Rouen, les Essars. But it must have been a day of mixed emotions for you because you scored your first Grand Prix victory, but Joe Schlesser was killed in the race. It must have been a, you know, the joy of winning. You know, the I lived, I lived two circumstances. Uh, I lived two circumstances, circumstances like that. Of course, it was my first victory, but it counts for nothing because that weekend was only. A weekend of sadness, total sadness, um, and unfortunately, coming to Formula One in those days, it was accepted, and uh, but still the sadness was there. Even more, um, Josh Lesser was uh, a really loved French Formula Formula a racing driver, loved by the people. It was his first Grand Prix at the age of 40. He drove, uh, he drove uh, the car that uh, John Surtees didn't want to drive because he considered it not developed enough. But for him, it was awesome, the dream of his life. 
And unfortunately, the next day, he was gone. So there were no join into that victory, except the satisfaction to have done well in dramatical conditions, dramatical weather conditions. Um, it was a, it was a challenge. Who was successful for me, but the rest that has no importance compared to the fact that uh, once again um, Schlesser died tragically. And I say it's a circ it's, it's the first of out of two times I had to face that in the 70s, for example. Uh, luckily, I had that in, at Watkins Glen where I could have won the championship. I had a problem with an engine, an injector, and I say luckily because there is no joy, no joy at all, no satisfaction to beat someone who was gone. Jochen Rien at the time had this fatal accident in, uh, in Monza. I think sometimes life is well made. I would have no joy today to say I, have, I had score maybe one or two or three more points than him when he wasn't there to defend himself. So life is well made. He was the world uh, champion, posthume, but he also he scored the largest number of points. So it was totally normal. But winning would have been terrible, I think. So how, how did you deal with the acceptance of risk? Because, I mean, in 1968, several drivers died. It was, a, it was a common thing, as you say. I think that's a, view f that's a view from outside, in my opinion. In motor racing, if you have some fear or if you have an, uh, an instinct or conservation always leading you, you have no chance to be a, a driver. So it was present in those days. We knew it. But it was accepted as a fatality and also a freedom. The freedom to do what you want, to take the risks you want, and to assume your passion. But also it's clear that every before every Grand Prix, leaving home on Thursday, uh, traveling to... Not one of us knew if he was going to be uh, alive the, the weekend after. It was sometimes uncomfortable, but the passion at the end takes, takes over all these considerations. It's on the subject of, of, of risk. I remember that obviously Jackie Stewart was very uh, proactive in calling for greater mm -hmm. safety in Formula One, and you were slightly less or more ambivalent, and I think you've said that in the past that, that risk was an inherent part of racing and, and should be preserved. We, I think we have to make clear that uh, Jackie and um, some other drivers as well, and Jean-Marie Balestre from the, from the Federation, did a giant uh, work to improve safety. They were really the starters of the changes in motor racing, just to, de to, to diminish the risk to uh, make the race course safer and the tracks. I always agree on that. I didn't agree on the way they proceed to reach their goals. Mm -hmm. That was sometimes why I was reluctant. What, but what, what did you oh, object oh, oh, to? Or oh, can you, oh, can you uh, discuss the fact that in those days the idea was the, the durability in a way. It's not to live once just to be an hero and then uh, Living Earth, no, it's it's a goal, and, and and luckily, if you look the performances in Formula One today or in motorsport today, it's day and night. It's an incredible success, but it's good and it's nice of you to mention it. Already uh, Jimmy, already Jimmy Clark, or Jochen Rindt, in that period, where because they were experienced drivers, they knew where they were going. They were full support to uh, Jackie Stewart, to Balestre. All these group of people who met, they did something fantastic for motor racing, really. And of course, 
you staged your own safety protest at Le Mans in 1969 when you walked. So you cannot say always <laughs> that I you cannot say uh, that I am against or no no, no no absolutely yeah. it's only a matter of philosophy not on the subject not on it's not an utopia to improve mm. the safety it's something who has to be done and uh, I thank you to mention uh, Le Mans <laughs> uh, once I stopped the race in Monte Carlo as well because it was raining uh, much too much nobody can say I'm not good or not an expert on rain conditions. No, I'm in favor of it. And thank you for mentioning Le Mans. Le Mans. For our listeners and, and viewers who, who did, can you explain what your protest was and, and why you were protesting? Well, there have been, there have been a number of accidents at Le Mans who may have been uh, aware tragic and some who may have been tragic like, like the accident of uh, Henri Pescarolo. Uh, the death of uh, the death of uh, Lucien Bianchi, for example, also in the private testing, and in that period of time, the seeds bells were fairly new in motor racing, in a way. And um, it's clear, seed belts it's a huge improvement in motor racing. But there were still some people believing that. Uh, it was better to be ejected from uh, the car rather than uh, staying in. So there's still a little bit of opposition. But Le Mans is very specific because you run to your car and then during one and a half or one or forty at the time, you drive your GT40, for example, flat out down the street without seat belts. Uh, you can try to put it in down the street, but I guarantee you it's not easy to put a seat belt at 300, uh, at 200 miles per hour. It's difficult. So I choose because in those days also, it was not only the physical effort, but the goal was to bring a car to the finish. So you were cruising at a cert certain average speed to finish the race. It's not like today. Today it's a Grand Prix, the 24th of Le Mans. It's flat out, let's say uh, 10 Grand Prix in a row or 13, flat out. If you don't know any trouble, you win. But in those days, you, it was much more comfortable. So you could take the risk. You could take the risk to start last because you have 24 hours to come back. Luckily for me, it works. Because now imagine the opposite. Suppose I am second behind uh, Anserman at 100 meters, you would have said, <laughs> rather than uh, uh, playing the game and uh, waving it, you have been beaten. What do you say now? But there are certain things in life that um, you cannot write down. It just happened. And for the best of Le Mans also, I think they changed the rule. And now we make it in, in a sense of honor. At Le Mans, you still have the cars today. In a row near the wall, you, you do the start, you come back, you go, but at least you've got your seat belts on and it goes into the right direction. I mean, for you, that was not a career changing moment, but it was your first victory at Le Mans, the first of six, four of them with Porsche. Um, I think the 1977 race I'd like to discuss because that one, you, you and Henri Pescarolo retired your Porsche early on mm -hmm. and then you went into the other car which was, was also had problems and you were about 42nd or 43rd or something mm -hmm. and you came back, had more problems late in the race but still won. That was the most extraordinary race for you. I must, I must say that if someone tells you you're going to win Le Mans one time you're ready to sign up. No discussion. When you won six, when you win six times, it's like uh, playing the number six at the casino, huh? and you take the number six six times in a row. And but um, yes, for the people, Le Mans '69. For the public, it remains something special. Yes. For the drivers' aspect and the team. And the engineer in those days, 77, as you mentioned, was a very, very, very special race. Because as you said, we were out of the race 
Then I was reserve driver on a car who was 41st at the time, after three years, and we won. So the first thing you have to think, never give up. Because in motor racing, you never know. Everything is possible. But was, what was fantastic, I think, the, the attraction of seeing yourself progressing into the overall um, classification, being 41st, an hour later being 31st, an hour later being 20th, and then, and then, and then, at the end, you are within the last three, it makes you believe that everything is possible. And then you drive, I think it's one of my best races, frankly. It, there are a few like that, but uh, it's only once a year or once every two or three years that you really go to the limit. The attraction was also that we, could, we were able to go to the limit non-stop. What was fantastic is to have the co-drivers believing it was possible. They drove at the limit non-stop. The mechanics were at the limit non-stop in their, uh, their, um, um, in the pit stop to change the tires, they were so, so fast. It was just incredible. And that's happened only once, time to time. You were, you were still racing in Formula One at that stage, but you'd left Ferrari at the end of 1973, you went to Lotus, and then Wolf Williams, Ensign. Were you starting to form, I mean, you didn't really, your career in Formula One at that stage was quite unsettled, whereas in sports cars with Porsche, Everything. Were you sort of falling out of love a little bit with Formula One by then, or? In sport, you climb the mountain. It's not easy. To stay on top, it's still not easy, because you have other people behind you who climb the mountain, they reach the top, they are younger, they follow you, they fight with you. When you start on the other side of the mountain, you start to slide slowly and to go down some slowly. Uh, that's life. That is the way sport has to be. Uh, for me, um, you can say I had a marvelous, marvelous life. No, there are also some bad decisions and there are also some uh, extremely sad moments. But, um, Yes, that was not a good decision because I drove for Ferrari for five years, but the last season was really dramatic, dramatical because the car were very poor. And what makes you move ahead? It's your ego. It's the desire to win. When you are frustrated, ask uh, Alonso today what he feels to be, uh, I mean, he's generous, he's talented, everybody uh, feel a little bit sorry for him. Uh, now he goes long distance as well, Formula One, Indy, okay. But the goal is to have more ego than the others and it's a need, uh, it's, uh, it's a must to, be, uh, to have that e ego sense of uh, winning. So, yes, I drove for Lotus. Uh, it was not a satisfaction. I had a number of failure, important failure, mechanical failure in it. Um, it's something, it's a reality. Uh, to be fast, you have to be uh, confident in your car. And then you start to go down. And uh, uh, luckily for me, luckily for me, in 79, uh, I replaced Patrick de Paillet with de Ligier. And um, it was really a lucky moment because I had the chance to drive a good car. But I realized I wasn't, I wasn't ready to pick up the last three tenths of a second or makes a difference between a, a winner and a loser in a way. So I was able to leave Formula One after 12 seasons or 10, 11, 12 seasons uh, without regret. And then from that on, I come back to long distance racing. It was demanding, physically demanding, but not the same stress because the, the philosophy of long distance was not the same philosophy as Formula One. So there was a place for me into it and I was able to continue. And when 
I reached the end of uh, endurance racing. Um, tragically, tragically in a way, because I was involved in an accident with Stefan Beloft at, uh, at, uh, at Spa. Uh, it hurts. Was, was it that, was hurts that, was and that? It hurts and... Uh, you see, one of, one of the miracles of my life, it's having done so many things for so long, more than 30 seasons on mechanical sport, without having been badly hurt. Uh, it's a miracle because it's not a, a matter of talent to survive in motor racing in that era. It was a matter of luck. And um, I had that luck. You, you've said before... We have the same... Mm. When I meet Jackie, the other Jackie, it's something we say permanently. The first thing we say, how oh, lucky uh, we are to have survived that uh, era. Well, you two are the great survivors, and you're probably the, the, the only ones left, really, in many ways. I, I, before we wrap, I just wanted to ask you about... You've been a team player. Um, you're very much a team player when you're a driver, and you've talked about the driver just being a small part of um, a team effort. I just wondered what your favourite team was or what you rate as, as the best team. From I, like, Tyrell, I, like, Porsche, I really like when you mention that because there is something really unfair in the glory, whatever it's motorsport or movie or whatever, to be under the spotlights. It's, it's tempting to say... I did uh, that, that I am, I, no, the reality, you are what you are because in front of you, in motor racing especially, you have a group of people who are starting a project, they put all their know-how into it, they do things 100%, uh, and they give you a winning car, and I always say, Today, I always say, it's easy to win when you have a winning car. And you are only the final link to the project. Of course, they call you in the car because they believe you can win a race and you are good in racing. But please remember that uh, it's not the driver the secret. It's a group of people who have only, they work in the shadow, they have only um, a, ce a cerebral, personal cerebral satisfaction to have done the job well. Their reward is winning, but nobody knows them. I mean, it's a generality, there is always someone. But in motorsport, you have to keep that in mind. And if I have been successful, because there is also something you don't control, is the timing to be at the right place at the moment. It, it's, it's something you cannot quantify. Yes, I had the privilege to be often at the right place with the right people. And my expression, my, my expression today is to say, thank you for inviting me to speak about what I did. But I am the result of group of people Italians, English, Cantero, Lenzo Ferrari, and other John Weyer, Porsche, and many others who made it possible. And I think that's valid for everyone in life. In journalism, in magazine, newspaper, there is always someone who say, would you be free to do that? Would you be interested to do that? And they make you grow. The basic idea is to give a hand to those who are behind you and to, uh, take, them, uh, to take them up. Jackie, it's been a great, great, Pleasure having you today. I know you've got other appointments, so we have to cut this shorter than we'd like. We'd love to have you back for another. There's so much more we'd love to discuss. It's because but you are hungry, huh? No, it's you not. Want no, to no, have no, no. That's, 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 the, that's the French and the Belgians who have three-hour lunches. We eat sandwiches. You, we, we, it takes or, ten or minutes. Oh, Belgian fries. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Belgian fries with may mayonnaise. Yeah, but I'd just like to thank you very warmly for joining us today at the Royal Automobile Club. Joe, thanks for your contributions, and thanks to all of you for listening. We will be back again very soon. Alan Hyde, behind the sound desk, thank you very much for all you've done. Um, oh, Jackie, you want to say one I more would, thing? Yes, one last thing. Yeah. Racing wouldn't exist without the passionate people who come to uh, watch motor racing. They play a giant role 
into motor racing. Very often they are forgotten because nobody asks them what they want to see or they feel about this or they feel about that. But um, their passion makes organization possible and makes driver give them the chance to drive uh, racing cars. And it's very important to mention them because it's a great help too for someone uh, who drives in motor racing and uh, they are fascinating also these people. Well, we'd be passionate. Thank to you. <laughs> now <laughs> you can have your lunch. <laughs> you can even <laughs> have a steak. I don't eat meat, sorry. <laughs> are we you a uh, vegan, veggie? I just don't like it. All right. <laughs> um, we'd be passionate to have you back for a further discussion at some point in the future. Thanks for your time and thanks to everybody for listening. We'll look forward to seeing you again at the next Royal Automobile Club talk show in association with motorsport. Thank you very much.